we've seen that we need to think about the entropy change in the surroundings when we consider the second law of thermodynamics. And in this video, we're going to make delta S for the surroundings more intuitive and more useful by recasting it in terms of state functions of the system. We can do this as long as we use tailor-made or appropriately constructed surroundings. We'll see what those look like in this video and ultimately develop a system-centric statement of the second law of thermodynamics. So the magnitude of delta S for the surroundings to some extent depends on the nature of the surroundings and the nature of the process, right? Delta S for the surroundings, according to the classical definition of entropy, is equal to the heat transferred to the surroundings divided by the temperature. But we don't usually care about the surroundings as chemists. We only really care about the chemical system. So we want to reformulate the second law in terms of the system only. Is it possible to do this using suitably constructed surroundings? Imagine we have free reign to kind of imagine the surroundings however we want to imagine them. Can we do that such that only quantities, specifically only state functions related to the system, appear in this inequality of the second law? The answer is that we can, and this was done by Josiah Willard Gibbs, whose picture is in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide. The state function that pops out of this bears his name today. All right, so to begin thinking about this, let's go back to this idea of entropy change as energy dispersed or reversible heat divided by temperature. In most processes, some heat, let's call it Q surroundings, is transferred to or from the surroundings. For chemical processes at constant temperature and pressure, this heat transfer is equal to the negative of the enthalpy change within the system, negative delta H. But as long as we construct the surroundings so that the process is reversible, well then that change in enthalpy, negative delta H, is equal to the reversible heat. As long as we make sure that the process is reversible, we can just simply add the rev subscript. And the basic idea here is to use grains of sand, like we saw before. Now, for a chemical process, this is a little bit less intuitive because, for example, how do we barely allow a chemical process to go forward? The basic idea is to kind of do it one molecule at a time. One molecule of A reacts, and then another molecule of A, and then another molecule of A, and then another molecule of A, etc., 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 very, very slowly, very, very deliberately on an infinitesimal scale. As long as we run the chemical reaction reversibly, we can calculate the entropy change in the surroundings using this basic classical definition of the entropy change as delta S of the surroundings is equal to negative delta H divided by temperature. All I've done is substituted in negative delta H for the heat transferred to the surroundings. But delta H, that's the enthalpy change for the reaction system. So we can now plug in this expression into the second law and develop an expression for the second law that relies on the system only. We've done it. So in the bottom equation here, what I've done is I've taken out delta S of surroundings and replaced it with negative delta H of the system divided by the temperature. Remember, we're assuming that the reaction is taking place at constant pressure and temperature, which is very typical for chemical reactions. Room temperature and atmospheric pressure are the norm. If we multiply through by the temperature and multiply through by negative one, we arrive at this expression for the second law. Delta H, which is by itself now since we multiplied through by temperature, minus the temperature times delta S is less than or equal to zero now since we multiplied through by negative one. Like we saw when we developed the enthalpy expression, this entire expression on the left hand side is equal to the change in a new state function. And in the next video, we're going to look at this state function in more detail. It's called the Gibbs free energy.